you're ready to worship. If you're ready to give him something this morning, worship is us giving something to him this morning. So I just encourage you not to wait this morning. Not to wait until you feel something, but to push past uh, those feelings and all those things and give him something this morning as an offering of praise. Amen. Amen. Cry out to you, Jesus. 
me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down, Lord. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down, Lord. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down, Lord. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down.
never gonna let me down. You're never gonna, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna, you're never gonna let me down. so good. Let's give him about 15 seconds of praise. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You are so good. You are so good. You go Oh 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God is worthy. While we were worshiping, I could hear this in my spirit. I could hear people say, Lord, I, I, I want to get to you, but it just seems like I can't get there. Lord, I want more, deeper, higher. It just doesn't seem like I can climb high enough. And as I was hearing that in my spirit, I, I said, Lord, there's got to be a way. There's got to be a way. Give us the way. Give us a plan. And I saw a cloud descending from glory. And I saw it come and settle down to where it was just within our reach. And I saw the Lord open up and extend down a ladder. And he said, the way, the way to me has already been made. The way to me has already been made. And even when you think you can't get there, I'm here to help you to get there. I'm here to help you to flow in and out of my presence and my glory. I'm here to give you access. I am not far off from any one of you. God says, I'm here right now. Come, run up the ladder. Come, see yourself. See yourself running up the ladder into my presence. As we sing this again, how am I getting there? I'm getting there through worshiping Him. How am I getting there? I'm getting there through bowing down. How am I getting there? I'm getting there through faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith, I walk by faith, not by sight. I want us, while we're singing this song, to close our eyes and by faith begin to see yourself going up and through the cloud into the glory and presence of the Father. Jesus has made a way for us. Let's go through this morning. And I want you to know as you go through, there's healings. As you go through, there's deliverance. As you go through, there's salvation. As you go through, there's baptism. As you go through, there's the glory of the Lord. And He will rise upon you. And He'll do for you what you're sitting there feeling like I cannot do. By faith, church, let's go through.
The waters are troubled. You can feel, you can sense the thickness of his presence. You can even sense the breath of his presence. If you're here this morning, If you're here this morning and you need salvation, the Savior's here. If you're here this morning and you need a healing, the healer is here. The deliverer is here. While the baptizer is here. While we are feeling this. Step out right now, wherever you're at. I want more, Lord. I want to surrender more of myself. I want God to do a work in me. Right now, right where you are, step out, step out into the water. Don't be backward. Don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated. Step out from where you are. Come forward. Lift up your hands to the Lord. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. God's wanting to do a fresh work. Come on to the water. Come on to the water. Step out into the river. Step out into the river. He's still working on us. Come on, shake off all those heavy bands. Break free this morning. from old mindsets. Let the Holy Spirit do in you what you need today. Come on, who else is going to come and get in the water?
much better your way, Lord. That's right. Give him high praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Loose the praises. Come on. Loose your praise to him. Man, it's in there. It's in there, but sometimes it don't come out right. Come on. Loose that, loose that thing up. Give him praises. Hallelujah. The highest praise. He is worthy. He is worthy. When you taste of him, you see how good it is. It's better than that old way. He rescued me from that old way. And I praise him. I am determined to praise him till he comes and gets me. Till he comes and gets me. That is my life. I'm going to praise him. He is so good. Glad to see you this morning. We're going to continue to worship the Lord in giving. Amen. We're excited about giving this morning. I want you to think of it this way as this was dropped into my thoughts this morning. If, if you're going to buy a gift for a special friend, if you've you got a special friend and you're going to get them a gift and you have, you have notice of that, you have notice every Sunday what we're going to do, even though we repeat when we're worshiping our giving, we're going to first be obedient to bring our tithes in, right? Out of obedience. That's what God expects. He, he wants you to be obedient. He loves that. But in our offerings is a gift. So I want you to think about that. If you was bringing a, getting a gift for a friend, you wouldn't just grab anything. You know that individual. It has to be special. Oh, it has to fit that person. I want something good. I want it special for them. That's the same way it is with our offerings, church. Don't just grab anything. Don't just bring anything. He says we rob him. We cheat him. Part of that's in our offerings. You can wrestle with things, and it's not about your, it's not about getting your money. I'm gonna tell you, if you look at our statements here at Bethesda, praise the Lord, how God is supplying miraculous things with much going on, much going out, praise the Lord, to the kingdom. That's what we're about, enlarging the kingdom of God. Touching people's lives. Think about your offerings. Think about that in advance. Okay, Lord, lay on my heart. I don't want to just say it from here, but I want it to come from here. I don't want to be far from him. Just think about that. Father, we love you this morning, and as a, as a body of Christ, we love to give. We love to help others others right near us, around us. God, we're always looking for those opportunities that you make. And God, you are our provider. You provide for every need. And God, we just celebrate that goodness this morning. Uh, we, we ask your blessings over the church, over the tithe and the offering today, God, that you would multiply that. God, for your glory and for the kingdom of God. And we just give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.
how many of you know you can have all the information in the world and be dead? It's more than information. That knowledge is about an intimate, personal knowing. Where we take the knowledge, we take what we hear, we take what we see, and we do it. Amen? I want to be a doer of God's Word. How do I do it? I do it from, and it's birthed in me, from my intimacy with Christ. In that relationship, in that revealing, in His touching my life, in that experience I have with Him. And that's what we are about when we do these seminars. Getting more information on how we can plug in and do what God wants us to do. And so, um, we want you to do that. But uh, we will be having a sign-up for the 28th at 4 o'clock for the Bethesda Informational Class. Uh, next weekend, it'll be out in the foyer. Please sign up for that. Those of you that have never been in it or want to know more about Bethesda and what we do here. And so, we want you to do that. Right now, we're thankful. Again, how many of you are thankful for Pastor Jason being here? Yeah. Pastor Jason, when I first went to Salina in 1992, was a 18-year-old, 18-year-old little thug. He wasn't following the Lord. He's a prodigal. Been raised in church all of his life, but was not doing what was right. You know, wrapped up in a lot of things like a lot of other Teenagers get wrapped up into things that are more important than the kingdom of God, sports, athletics, girls, all those type things. Normal, normal kid stuff that takes place. But his dad, Pastor Gary King, his dad went to Jason and he said, Jason, he said, I'm calling in a marker. I want you for me. Even if you don't feel like you should, I want you for me to go on this mission trip to Belize. And Jason, being a good son, loving his father and honoring his father, said, I'll go, Dad. So Jason went to work, told him he was going to need some time off, and he went on a mission trip to Belize. Well, while he was in Belize, the Holy Spirit just wrecked him. I'm just giving you a little bit of his history. Holy Spirit wrecked him, and so he called his work and said that he wasn't coming back early, and, and he was staying, I think it's something like that. But anyway, he came back, and he began to walk the kingdom life. And I had the privilege of being a part of discipling Jason. His dad felt like he needed somebody else besides his father and, and talked to me. And I began to connect with Jason. And, and I, I have to say, I have to say that it's one of the highlights of my life. He, he's been a real blessing. He's been a good son, faithful, dedicated, committed. And God has raised him up to do some awesome things even though the enemy doesn't like it. How many of you know the enemy, he don't mind if we hear or even see. He just hates it when we start to do. Did you hear me? He doesn't care if you come in here every week and hear. He doesn't care if you come in here every week and you see. He just hates it if you start doing it. He just wants to lull you to sleep, get you feel comfortable, stay on the fringes, stay back, stay hold out. But, man, when we start to do, he gets mad. Well, he hates Jason because Jason is a doer, not just a hearer only. And I appreciate him, and I love him, his wife, his family. Uh, and, matter of fact, his second son is getting ready to marry my niece, Alyssa, in September. So, so you know, we, we were really related, but we're really, really going to be related now. Uh, and, and, you know, just... Just a real blessing. I love them. I appreciate them. I, but I want you to know I don't have them here because of the fact that he's my, one of my disciples or my son. I believe we have him here. The elders have him come here because he's got something deposited in him that we need. And that's what we got this weekend. That's what we're going to get this morning if we pay attention. But we love him, and we're going to do something that we don't do a lot here, but we're going to receive another offering, and this offering is for him. Maybe you've given in the first one for him. That's fine. But I, I want us to ask the Lord.
We hear and we see. I want us to ask the Lord, God, what do you want me to sow? You know, this church did a great job when the Rigdons were here. When the Rigdons were here, man, we talked about sowing seed in good soil. And the church responded. We sent the Rignans home with over $11,000 for four or five days. And I'm not talking about monies that we took out of the fund. I'm talking about monies that people gave from their heart. Not because they were beat up and made to feel ashamed because they didn't have anything or didn't do anything. Just because the Holy Spirit moved and God touched their lives and they gave. I mean, that, that's the biggest offering we've ever taken up for anything. I'm not envious of that. I thank God. I, I would have give, I'd have give praise to God if it had been 20. I don't care this morning what we send Pastor Jason King off with this morning. This isn't a payback for his labor. This is, this is letting him know, brother, we love you and we want to be a part of what you're doing. Bethesda wants to be a part of what you're doing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this. Most of you don't know this, but... He, he's at New Life Christian Center in Salina, Ohio, where I was at for eight years. And they, and we always had, but they have a real heart to sow. They're not just people that get. They're not just after getting, they're after sowing. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something today that you probably don't know, but it's the truth. We, we, have, we have myself here that's paid a salary by Bethesda. I'm blessed. But we also, how many of you all know, where's he at? Where's Sean at? Oh, see Sean back there? That nice looking young man. He's back there. Do you know, he, do you know that he's full time here at Bethesda? Did you know that? Yeah, he's every day. He's here working, laboring, helping, serving. Every day. Do you know what? Bethesda by itself, we weren't able to do that. But the Holy Spirit spoke to Gary King, who spoke to their elders, who heard the Lord and saw what the Lord wanted to do, and they sowed into Bethesda toward him being full-time in the ministry. <laughs> I mean, wow. You know, you just don't get that today. But they did it, not just one year, but two years. God has blessed them, and God's continued to bless them. And this morning, we're going to sow an offering into this life. And we're going to listen to the Lord. I know you might already have out what you pulled out of your wallet. But we're going to listen to the Lord, and we're going to obey in Jesus' name. Because that's what we're about, right? Because we know when we sow into good ground, what do we expect? When a farmer sows into good ground, what do they expect? A crop. We're sowing into good ground as Bethesda because I'm getting ready to tell you, we're getting ready to do some things around here that God's going to sow back into us from what we have sowed into the ground in good soil. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you so much for all that you do. All of your goodness and mercy to us, we thank you. We give you praise and glory and honor. We thank you for what you're about to do. And we thank you for Jason and the ministry that you have given to him. We thank you for his family. And we ask God that you just open up the windows of heaven and pour him out a blessing that he cannot contain. In Jesus' name, amen.
I'm living proof of what the mercy of God can do. If you knew me then, you'd believe me now. He turned my whole life upside down, took the old and he made it new. That's just what the mercy of God can do. Now I'm alive to tell the story, now I've overcome this goodness and Based on what I've done, but the goodness and mercy, the power of the blood. I thought I deserved to be six feet beneath the earth for all the things I've done. The things I've said, the choices made that I regret. Oh, I would still be lost. But for the mercy of God, now I'm alive to tell the story how I've overcome this goodness and I'm so glad that my freedom wasn't based on what I've done, but the goodness and mercy, the power of Love the power of the blood, don't you? I believe the Lord wants to um, just minister a couple things real quick here. Um, I feel like I got a word of knowledge that somebody here, possibly, or you know somebody, uh, has a thyroid problem uh, that God wants to lay hands upon and heal today. I believe that God wants to do a work in somebody right now. And I believe we got to do what the Bible says to believe in the power of the blood. And that if there's any sick among you, to come, let the elders of the church lay hands upon you, anoint you with oil. So if there's anybody here, raise your hand. If it's you, all right, come on up here real quick. 
Can I get a couple of the elders here? I'm just going to give you the oil. Here's one other one. I just felt like God said that somebody here knows somebody. I don't think they're here. I think actually you know somebody that actually has throat cancer. Um, and if, you, if that's you, we want to anoint your hands right now, right? So if you have a thyroid problem, uh, I'm going to get some of the elders maybe to come and take the oil here. Is it, who, who knows of somebody that's got throat cancer? You know of somebody, and God wants you, you know of them. All right, I'm going to anoint your hands. Come here, brother. I'm going to anoint your hands because you're going to go forth and do the work. Amen? Father, in the name of Jesus, I anoint my brother's hands in the name of Jesus. He's going to go to this friend, Lord God. He's going to lay his hands upon him, Lord Jesus, and he's going to pray the prayer of faith, believing that what he is imparting is the power of the blood of Jesus, the blood that does not just not just uh, give us salvation, but it also heals our every infirmity and every single disease, disease Lord God. And we, I just pray, Lord God, that he would cast out the spirit of infirmity upon this friend or family member, whoever it is, Lord God. He would lay hands upon the sick and see them recover in Jesus' name. So, Lord God, we pray right now, we declare in faith that healing will come. Lord God, that cancer must go in Jesus' name. That you do a miraculous work in Jesus' name. Hallelujah and amen. Amen, brother. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord God, for the word to come forth right now in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. While they're praying for them, I just felt like God also put in my heart, prophetically speaking, that there's a young man here. I'm not sure who you are. When I say young, I'm 49, so someone younger than me, okay? But there's some young man here that you're in the valley where you're, you feel like you have to make a decision, some life decision, like career choice or uh, career path choice. Um, and you came here even today, this morning, you woke up, God, so I just need to make some decisions in my life. I'm not sure what decision uh, that you want me to take, what path that is. Who is that right now? Raise your hand. Come on. Come here. Yep, it's all right. It could be more than one. Just stand right here. Nate, come on up too. I want you both to receive this. You take this. Obviously, every time you get a prophetic word, what we do with it, we pray over it. We judge it by the word of God. Uh, we take it to uh, pastors and leaders in our lives, all right? But I really felt what the Lord was saying uh, when, I, when I pictured some young man standing up was this. That do not take the path, do not take the path that seems right to you. There's a way that uh, seems right unto man, but the way thereof leads to death. And I'm not saying to your physical death, it just brings separation. What God wants right now in your life is not for you to be pulled away in any way, shape, or form from the Spirit of God or the path that you're on and seeking God. God wants you to be all in with Him. And there's going to be a desirous path, but don't take the desirous path. There's a path that, that the enemy is placing in front of you. It's not evil. It's not wicked. Uh, and, and the, it's not even, it's probably even a wrong thing, but what it is is an enticement to draw you away from what God God has, what the Spirit of God has for you in this time and this season to grow close to Him. He doesn't want separation from His presence. He doesn't want separation from His Spirit. What He wants to do is entwine His life with yours. And so God is calling you to reject an offer that is about to come because the way thereof will lead you away from the presence of God, not uh, uh, away in apostasy, but it will lead you away from God uh, to the point where you're not going to be on fire for Him the way that you desire to be on fire. You desire to be on fire. And God wants you to understand right now, there's nothing that you've done wrong whatsoever. It's just that there's going to be an enticement that's going to come, a path that's going to come. It's going to seem, Mom, that's a good offer. That's a good offer. The Lord says, don't take it. Don't take it. I was offered the world on a platter. I didn't take it. I didn't take it. I didn't take it. Because, number one... I'm going to get it back anyways, amen? And the Lord is your sustenance. It's not going to be the dollar signs. Don't be, don't be enticed by trip uh, six-digit numbers. You hear me? Don't be enticed by six-digit numbers. Just let the, let the Lord guide you and lead you. Submit these things to the leadership of the church uh, and, and just at, for the wisdom and the sake of that. So, Father, I pray right now for these two men in Jesus' name, Lord God, that you'd cause them to be wise, 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 Lord God, in the steps that they take forward in you, Lord God. They came here today with questions, Lord Jesus, of what am I to do, Lord? Lord, show me your way. Show me your path. It's not for you guys to determine the path. It's for you to simply listen and obey. And we pray for their feet right now, Lord God, in Jesus' name, that you anoint them to walk the path that you have for them 
in Jesus' name. They will not walk, they will not stray one step out of the way that you have for them, but they will only walk in the path that you have, Lord God, set before them. You've been to their future. You've seen the end of this thing because God knows the end from the beginning and he knows exactly where he's taking you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You go, brother. Bless you. Amen. Oh, I feel good now. I hadn't loaded the burden. All right. <laughs> Hallelujah. You may have a seat at this time. Hallelujah. Sometimes God stirs things up in you, you know, and you feel like it's a burden. Like, I got to get, get this thing off my shoulders, right? And I was like, I don't know if anybody's going to stand up for this or that. But you just go out in faith anyways. Yeah. The worst thing that can happen is I look like a fool for Jesus, and I'm okay with that. Are you? Yeah. Amen. I'm okay with that. I've looked ridiculous many, many times before. I've been to wedding receptions and stuff. I look stupid out there on the dance floor. Amen? Well, come on. You know what I'm talking about. All right? You've done some silly things. I did things on a dare that I probably should have never done. Uh, but you know what? I'm here to do whatever I can for the Lord. Amen? And if that's to look silly for him, I'll look silly for him all day long if I know that God is leading me. Amen? Hallelujah. Uh, this morning, I am going to turn on a fire hose again. I'm sorry. For all you guys that were in the seminar, we crammed 12 hours of information into 8 hours, and you got leveled with a fire hose. Today, I'm not going to turn off the fire hose. You okay? You all right with that? So I'm going to give you a lot of scripture. I may or may not go to them. I may just quote them. I may just tell you where they're at. You're going to have to write them down. All right? You may, you're probably going to have to go back, and you're going to have to listen to this again, okay? And that's okay. It's all right to go back and listen to sermons two and three times. Because you're going to have to catch everything that I'm going to throw at you today. And I believe that God really wants to give you an abundance of stuff today. Amen. But I want to release something in your heart this morning. The message I'm going to preach today is Jesus, the son of man. Jesus, the son of man. And I want you to understand something. We have got to learn to see that Jesus was fully human. He became a man. The son of God came to this earth to do something, to show us a way. Amen. And I want us to understand the humanity that Jesus walked in. To actually today, to leave this building today, having a greater knowledge and understanding in our hearts that Jesus was the Son of God, but also the Son of Man. How many of you guys have uh, been watching any episodes of The Chosen? Raise your hands. I mean, I think it's awesome. I, listen, I don't care if it's not following necessarily exactly uh, every, every you know, timeline of Scripture and stuff, or they stray, or they add to the story because they got to take some you know, theatrical license to kind of add things in. That's not what it's all about. It's all about really showing and demonstrating. I heard someone just the other day say this, uh, that this woman who's a believer, her husband's an unbeliever, said that I would serve and follow that Jesus. Oof. And I was like, oh. You would follow that Jesus, the one displayed on a TV screen? Then what kind of Jesus has he had a picture of his whole life? In other words, what kind of Jesus have we presented to someone like this man who is an unbeliever? His wife's a believer, but he's an unbeliever and refuses to, to follow Jesus because his idea of Jesus is very much in a box. He's very stuffy. He's very restrictive. He never laughed. Come on. And I believe that that show is doing something to show us even the humanity of Jesus and his disciples. You know, of, of the 12 disciples, the church has done this for the last couple of thousand years here. We have venerated the 12 disciples. We've actually crafted their image into stained glass windows all across the, across the world, haven't we? You see, in stained glass, the disciples, and I'm not saying anything wrong with that. But because we venerated them and we put their, their, their images uh, in stained glass and cathedrals all around the world, we have sometimes held them to a higher standard that they weren't human. They might have been superhuman or somehow demigods or something. They were men like us. I want you to understand that. They messed up. They had problems. They were fearful. They were unassuming human beings. They had a propensity to make silly mistakes just like you and I. They did. That my, my Bible tells me a lot of stories, and it tattletales on Peter, on John, and all the disciples. There are times, and, and we kind of, I hit a couple of those in, in the, during the seminar the last couple of days, where I just believe Jesus had to slap himself in the head and say, oh my goodness, Lord, really these guys? Really, Lord, these guys here? You got to do something with them? Are you kidding me? How? And sometimes I wonder when I look at my life, I say, how? How are you going to get it done, Lord? 
understand this. They were men like you and I, and they had issues. Amen? And so we need to see, truly, today, the humanity of Jesus, even just the, the, the broken humanity that was the disciples, and even the early church. They didn't always get it right. Do you know that? When you read your Bible, do you see that they always did not get it right? There were times that they were out doing a job and, and working for Jesus and doing the things they're supposed to do. I mean, the Bible says in the Great Commission that these signs will follow them that believe. That was the only prerequisite that you had to believe. And they were casting out demons, right? But then there were times the disciples said, well, we tried. People said, well, we, I asked your disciples to cast out demons. They could not. And Jesus had to step in and take care of business that they could not take care of, even though they had done it time and time again. And you have to scratch your head and say, what? What's going on here? What's the deeper story? But Jesus showed us the way. He didn't just command us to go and do all these things and not do it himself. God wanted to demonstrate that, yeah, the way may be hard, but it's worth it. And I'm going to show you how to do it. Follow my example. There is no Hebrew word for lead. In other words, there's no Hebrew word, uh, or sorry, for leading from behind. Like uh, in, in a war, many times the generals will be back in the back lines, and they'll be ordering the foot soldiers and people what to do, and they're strategizing, right? But that's not, that's not what th that would mean in Scripture. What it means in Scripture would be that the general himself would be in the front of the army. I remember when we were down in, in uh, Yorktown years ago, and we saw where Cornwallis surrendered to George Washington. George Washington, to get his troops riled up, rode ahead, and there's bullets flying everywhere. Instead of staying in the back where he probably should have been and telling those guys to run forward, he led the charge on horseback. Bullets flying everywhere. Now, I can follow somebody that leads like that, amen? And Jesus doesn't sit behind here. He doesn't stay back in the back and send us rushing to the front lines to our demise. He chose to lead us there himself and show us the way the disciples learned it they had to overcome their fears their failures many times on a daily basis sometimes they learned a lesson on day this day over here and the next day they repeated the same mistakes over and over again to even feel qualified for the ministry that he called them to they didn't feel qualified many many times we're going to go through a couple of those examples here today does any of this sound familiar to you I at times feel like I, I don't know why God would even use me. I at times feel like I just, I don't have the words to say or, or I don't really have what God wants me to say. And it's just, I just, I throw myself at the mercy of his feet. I'm not trying to make stuff up. I want him to speak through me, amen? amen. So the terms son of God and son of man, I'm going to throw some things at you right now. Why the son of God and the son of man references? And even other references like son of David, which was a reference to that as well, to his divinity. The term son of man appears 259 times in the entire Bible. 89 times in the New Testament. And of those 89 times that it's spoken, son of man, spoken in the New Testament, all but three of those were out of the mouth of Jesus himself. Jesus said the phrase son of man 86 out of the 89 times that you see it in the New Testament. It's important. And he was speaking of himself. So the reference came from his own lips. And we, we would think that the title of son of God is the title of his actual divinity. And that the son of man was, well, that's more human in nature. But, but it's just the opposite. The term son of man, actually this title refers more to his divinity than we actually think. If you turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25, I'll show you this. Matthew 25, we'll start in verse uh, 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him. They we're talking about the return of Jesus, the Son of Man, and all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. The Son of Man is also who? The King. Because a king sits upon a throne. So this phrase, this term, Son of Man, speaks of him being the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 
and, be, and before him shall be gathered all the nations, and he shall separate them, one from the other, as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, the goats on his left hand. Then shall the king say unto them that are on the right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, of my father, inherit the kingdom. Now he's giving the kingdom. Only the king can give you the keys to the kingdom. Amen? Only the king can do that. And he called himself in this passage the son of man. He purposely didn't say son of God. Because he wants to... He wants to communicate something to you and I by saying it that way. For the kingdom of God prepared for you from the foundation of the world. In other words, from the very foundation when the world was laid, and we talked about the Garden of Eden and going back to the Eden, the Garden within Eden, and that it takes all the way back to the beginning. We go back to the foundation of all humanity because from the beginning he wanted us to be kings and priests. From the beginning, he wanted us to have dominion. And to be, to, to be one who has dominion, you have to be given that by one who is an, a, a great authority. And God gave that to man. Man squandered it. We lost it in the original fall. However, God wants us to claim it back. And Jesus did so. Legally, legally, Jesus claimed it all back. Because the devil murdered Jesus. And even though he was a murderer from the beginning... He always, he always had legal reasons for it, because it goes, again, back to the fall. But because he took Jesus and murdered Jesus, who was an innocent person, he could not keep him in that grave. Come on. He couldn't keep him there. He had no legal right to do that. And Jesus willingly, as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, laid his life down... And legally conquered sin and death eternally. And had the devils known... That putting him on that cross would have sealed their fate. They would have never done it. The devil is not all knowing. Somebody say amen. amen. He really messed up. He done messed up. Did he not? Hallelujah. Got an amen from heaven right there. Wow. Let the thunder roll. <clears throat> all right. And so again we see that he is the king. The son of man sits on the throne. He is the king. Now this term son of God actually appears fewer times in your Bible. 180 through the whole Bible. 72 of which are in the New Testament. And this term son of God really refers more to those who are in obedience to the will of the Father. Those who are in obedience to the will of the Father or to God the Father. Now the first mention of the phrase son or sons of God, you see that in Genesis 6. And these are those who are disobedient to God. Ironically. Because they were not obedient to God, the sons of God who were fallen angels, right, sinned. And they did all these wicked things. There were giants in the land, etc. We're not going to go into Genesis 6 on that. Now look at Matthew 26 in your Bible. Turn one page. And uh, we're going to look at verses 62 through 64. Now Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether or not you are the Christ, the Son of God. And again, they were expecting the Messiah to come. And when he came, he didn't come the way he, er, the world expected him to come. They expected someone to come, throw the Roman occupation out, and, and set Israel free, and bring Israel's autonomy back as a nation that's what they really wanted how many of you know that that is very myopic and short-sighted that's not what he came to do he didn't come to just get israel out of roman occupation because how many of you know a couple hundred years later they probably would have fallen right back into it just read the book of judges he didn't come to set them free for a hundred years or a couple hundred years he came to set them free once and for all and eternally and it's too often that we as believers, we, get, we look through temporal eyes, temporal viewpoint, life all around us, and we lose sight of eternality because of temporality. This temporal world is not what we were made for. We were made for communion with God, holy and uninterrupted with God for eternity. So when he says in John 14, in my father's, he says, you know, fear not, in my father's house there are what? Many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. We're not to be concerned about. Don't treasure up. Yeah, don't treasure up on this earth. Everything that you're trying to accumulate on this earth will not be yours at your last breath. 
Family members will squabble over it. They'll pick through it, and they'll throw a bunch of it away. Come on. And they won't find any value in what you find value in. Isn't that amazing? Something you've held on to and you could never let go of and never throw out on a trash day. Someone else will look at it and be like, what is this? Why did he or she ever even say it? And they chuck it in a dumpster. We put too much value in temporal things. And we have to keep our eyes above. Because where your treasure is, your heart is there. And if I'm treasuring up on earth, my heart's on earth. If I'm treasuring up in heaven, my heart is in heaven. One of the things that we treasure on this earth are our relationships. And when the relationships are broken by death, by separation, and loved ones of ours transfer from here to there, part of my heart goes there. It's transferred there. I miss my mom. She's been dead almost 10 years now. I miss her, and she's in heaven. And so part of my heart is there. So my longing is to be there one day. And that longing gets increased the more and more others that we treasure, relations that we treasure, transfer from here to there as we're left behind. It makes sense. But we don't sorrow like those who have no hope. Are you the Christ, the Son of God? And Jesus said to him, you have rightly said. Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. They ask, are you the son of God? He says, yes, I am the son of God. And you're also going to see me, the son of man. He makes both references here on purpose. Because he wants to convey a message to you and I. About being sons of God and sons of men. Amen? I'll get to that in a second. So the son of man statement that Jesus was, was giving was a claim to his divine authority on this earth amen matthew eleven eight. 8 don't have to turn there the son of man is even the lord of the sabbath they were challenging him about the sabbath was the sabbath made for man or was the man made for the sabbath you see that was the question that's being asked and so many times we think that we were made for the law no no the sabbath is to serve us he honored the sabbath god you know why god sabbath why he took a, a day of rest on the seventh day i'll tell you what it wasn't he wasn't tired you all right with that? You, you telling me the all-powerful God was like, oh, man, six days of creating worlds and I am gassed. I just need a break, chill out on the couch, watch some TV. No, that is not that at all how that went. God Sabbathed because he knew that we would get tired and we needed to follow his example. So he set the example for us. Not because he was tired, but because we would get tired. So he does for us, he does and demonstrates for us what he wants us to do, even though he doesn't get tired. You get worn out. You need to take one and seven off. Amen? That's just the truth. But he said, I'm the Lord, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. So to, to even say that you can't heal on the Sabbath, what, which one of you would, would not help someone whose, whose ox cart went off the side of the road on the Sabbath day? Of course you would help. And he makes some great cases for these things. So when I think about son of God and son of man, which perspective do you have a harder time understanding or comprehending? For me, it's son of man. I get it that he's the son of God. I mean, he was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. He spoke it into creation. He is God. Jesus is Lord. I get that. That is not hard for me to comprehend. What's hard for me to comprehend is that he became humanity. And I sometimes scratch my head, even still today, and think, how? Why? The one who created the heavens and the earth offers to a rich young ruler, sell all you have. Follow me, and you'll be my disciple indeed. You want to have eternal life? What has your heart right now is possessions, temporality. The things of this world have your heart. If you just chuck all that stuff to the side and follow me, you'll be my disciple indeed. And that guy walked away from the one who said, let there be light. And there was light. The very voice that said that beckoned this man to follow me, and he didn't. Can you imagine that? The regret at the end of his life, that he could have been one of the 12. 
Jesus himself says this, I came to testify to the truth. So why did Jesus come? Yes, to testify to the truth. But I really feel like one of the things that Jesus came to do is this. And just, you need to write this down. The Son of God became the Son of Man to teach the sons of man how to become the sons of God. I'm going to say that again. The Son of God became the Son of Man to teach the sons of man how to be the sons of God. He is teaching us how to walk out what he has given us, our authority, how to walk out as being the sons of God, the born ones of God, the ones who carry the eternal DNA of our Father. And we're going to look like him when we grow up. That's what it says in 1 John 3. We're going we're to look a lot like him. We don't know what we look like right now, but we're going to look just like him when we see him as he is. The Son of God became the Son of Man to teach the sons of man how to become the sons of God. I think it's a profound statement. Turn your Bibles to John 3. We all know John 3, 16. But let's look at a few verses right before that, starting in verse 13. And no man has ascended up into heaven, but he that came down from heaven. The only one that ever did it was Jesus, right? Even the Son of Man, the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, we talked about this yesterday, even so must the Son of Man, there it is again, be lifted up. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Twice in a row it says that. Verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And it's still the offer on the table today, amen? The Son of Man came, and he had to be lifted up, right? The New Living um, Translation says it this way. Uh, no one has gone to heaven in return except the Son. Jesus did this, right? And he had to conquer, again, sin and death in his three days that were in the grave. In Mark chapter 3, even the demons recognized his authority. They cried out in Mark chapter 3, you are the Son of God. yes. Yes, I am. He knew exactly who he was. But I want to tell you something right now. You are also the sons of God. And demons ought to shriek. And Jesus, I mean, there's one, he's just stepping out of a boat. He's just stepping out of a boat. And demoniacs are just, ah, you're the son of God. Shouldn't, shouldn't we, the carriers of the Holy Spirit, have that kind of effect on demon hordes that are inside of people? I believe that we are going to move into a time and an era where that's going to happen. God wants you to understand that Jesus became man to teach us how to be like God and be used by God. We are made in his likeness after all, amen? The Pharisees, they called themselves the sons of Abraham. You know, Abraham was a good dude, but they're setting their sights a little low. When you set your sights only on a man, and, and they, again, they venerated and honored Abraham for being the father of their faith. And I don't no problem with that, the way that they would always treat the patriarchs was with great reverence. However, Abraham had some flaws. We all know that. Just shake your head. I'm not saying anything nasty about Abraham, but Abraham definitely tried to help God out. Did he not? Ishmael. And whenever we try to help God out, you know what? We create Ishmaels too. I've created Ishmael's in my life. And then you got to contend with Ishmael the rest of your life sometimes. Amen? And so Abraham, he didn't always have the right answer. He didn't always have the right response. He, got, he lived in fear. Comes into a land, and he says, yeah, this is my sister. She's good looking, but yeah, it's my sister. Yeah, well, kind of, but it was his wife. And he did that more than once. You know? Well, it was a half-truth because she was, Sarah was his half-sister, so it was truly a half truth she is my sister but a half truth is really leading someone to a destination you want them to get to that isn't fully the truth which is actually his wife i don't think he walked around saying sister all the time i think he walked around saying wife all the time don't you think so and so what i'm saying is this that god wants us to understand that we are made in his image and we have a job to do that was no different than what jesus did he left the work 
to you and I. Amen. The Pharisees, again, like I said, they called themselves the son of Abraham. But Jesus said <laughs> that they were sons of their father, the devil. No, 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 no. Abraham's not your father. The devil is. You think that went over well? I think that went over in a crowd, right? Why did he call them the sons of their father, the devil? Because the devil was the one whom they obeyed. Whom they obeyed. They didn't know it. In Daniel chapter 3, the three Hebrew children are thrown into the fiery furnace, but when Nebuchadnezzar looks down, what does he see? Four. He says, I saw one like the Son of God standing in their midst. And they were not touched by the flames of fire. A heavenly one who descended to the earth to preserve mere humanity. These guys were powerless against that fire, but Jesus, amen? Except Jesus showed up in their midst. In Daniel 7, we see that Daniel has a dream in Daniel 7. And in this dream, he saw one like the Son of Man. There's that term. Like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, and he approached the Ancient of Days. The Bible is filled with so many references about the Son of God and Son of Man. Now, Jesus had to battle with men all the way through his life. He knew who he was. How many of you know that Jesus did not have an identity crisis? He knew exactly who he was. At age 12, he was about his father's business. Notice he's not doing carpentry work. He knew who his true father was and whose work he was to be about. And yet he still went back home with Joseph and Mary. And we don't see him really until age 30. Until age 30 again. From 12 to 30, we have all those years where we all, all, Jesus, we, all we know is he grew in stature and wisdom. He obeyed his earthly father. He learned a lot of good lessons. Obviously, God gave Jesus to Mary and Joseph because he trusted them to be good stewards of the Son of God. And every parent in here, God trusted you with your children because he wanted you to be a good steward of the sons and daughters of God. And I ask myself the question in fear all the time, how well am I doing? I do. And it's okay to have that kind of tension in your life. In Matthew chapter 9... If you look at this story, I love this story because Jesus starts bending brains real quick. We'll start in verse 2. Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he saw the faith that they brought him in. He said to the paralytic, son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. Now how many of you know when a paralytic is brought into church and brought up to the altar that everybody's expecting, oh, he wants healed. He wants to be able to walk. You all know that, right? And Jesus looks down and says, oh, I see what you need. Your sins are forgiven. He steps back and walks away. How would you feel if that's what happens? Someone brings somebody in here as a paralytic, and the elders are like, your sins are forgiven, and they walk away. Obviously, we're not here for sin. Yes, that was the greater thing, the greater need. Jesus always sees the most important need first. Look what it says here. And once some of the scribes said within themselves, this man, he, he blasphemes. He thinks he's God. Who does he think he is? I'm going to tell you right now. You do the work of God, you're going to have people tell you, who do you think you are? Who you think you're some hot shot? You think that, no, I just simply think I'm an obedient son of God or daughter of God. And I'm doing his will. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts... They apparently weren't saying it out loud, but they were certainly saying it in, the, in themselves and at least to each other. And it says, knowing their thoughts, that why do you think evil in your hearts? Which one is easier to say to somebody? To a lame man laying on a cot. Which, what's, what's easier for you to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? Not a trick question, really. Everybody in the room. What would be easier for you if somebody laying there could not walk? Would it be easier for you to say your sins are forgiven? Or would it be easier for you to say get up and walk? Sins are forgiven. That's a piece of cake, right? Yeah, because that's all internal stuff. But saying get up and walk, <laughs> what if they don't? See, Jesus nails them with this. Which one's easier to say? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth. To forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, rise up, take your bed and go to your house. And he rose and he departed and went to his house. 
so that you would know that I do have this kind of power and authority given by the Father. The Messiah was supposed to have healing in his wings. He was supposed to be the one that could do these things and forgive us of our sins. You see, he nailed him with a trick question. And he always did these kind of things. In Matthew chapter 15, don't go there, but in Matthew 15, the, the, the Pharisees come. And they say, why do your disciples disobey the traditions of our fathers? Traditions. Traditions, right? What about traditions? Traditions aren't necessarily biblical, always, amen? We all have some traditions and things that we do, and this is how this church does it kind of thing. It doesn't mean it's the law of the Medes and Persians. It doesn't mean that God sent that down from Sinai. You all know that, right? They're just traditions, the way we do some things. But sometimes we, we hold traditions in such high esteem and honor that it becomes our law. And it becomes our quasi-God that we serve. We sometimes serve our traditions. Somebody say amen. amen. And Jesus fires back. Why do my disciples? Because they weren't washing their hands before they ate bread. All right? That's a good hygiene thing. We all know that now, right? But for them, it was a tradition that they did these kind of things. So we're looking at it and thinking, it's really not a huge deal right? It's not massive thing here, but they were upset about it because it was one of their church traditions. And Jesus fires back and says, why do you disobey God? Instead of answering the question, I love it. So many times when Jesus asked the question, he didn't answer him. He just asked a better question. I think too often because we're trying to defend our faith, we always try to answer the question when we should actually ask a better question. Well, why do you do this? Why do you disobey your God? The disciples in verse 12 say this. They say, you know, you know Jesus, they, they went away later. And they're like, you, you know you offended all the Pharisees, right? <laughs> they were concerned uh, how the Pharisees looked at Jesus and looked at them. You know, you kind of ticked them off. That was, you know, was that really wise to do that? And you know what Jesus says? Ignore them. That's what he says. Forget those guys. We got better things to worry about. We got bigger things to take care of. We got bigger fish to fry. Ignore them. There's an element of people out there that you just need to ignore. You need to turn out, tune out the voices in your head. People that are telling you things that you know that you know that you know is not God. Just tune those voices out and ignore them. I'm not telling you to be mean to them. I'm just saying we've got to sometimes tune things out. Same chapter. The Canaanite woman comes. Jesus knows he is sent to the house of Israel to minister to the house of Israel. She's a Canaanite woman. She's not a Jew. But her daughter's vexed with demons, right? And finally Jesus says, eh, it's not fit that I give you know, the children's bread to a dog like you. you know, this, is, this is tough language. But she said, hey, listen, I know that you are, she's cried out and she said, you are the son of David. Which means son of David because he, she knew that the Messiah would come through the lineage of David in the tribe of Judah, and she recognized his authority, his position, and his messianic call. When his own people refused to recognize it through signs, wonders, miracles, all the things that he came to do, but this Canaanite woman saw this truly is the Messiah. The woman at the well in John 4, she knew this has to be the Messiah. It's the time that he should be coming anyways. He told me everything about my life. It took people who were not grown up in the church, who were not even believers, to actually see the light. Son of David, making reference to the fact that he was the king. The book of Matthew depicts him as the face of the lion or the king. It's the one gospel that depicts him in his kingliness. So if you go to, go to Matthew 11, we're going to jump through a few things here in Matthew. And I love this. In Matthew 11, we see that John is in prison. And go to um, uh, verse 2. Matthew 11, verse 2. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. And he said to him, are you the coming one? Are you the Messiah? Or do we look for another? They all knew, all the Old Testament prophecies pointed that Jesus, the Messiah at least, should show up at an appointed year. They knew it. Again, I told this in the class the other day. In John chapter 1, they came to John 
while he was baptized and said, who are you? And he's like, I'm not that guy. I'm not the Christ. I am not the anointed one. I am the voice of one saying, prepare you the way. I know he's coming after me. I know that the one that comes after me will baptize you with fire. I baptize in water. He'll baptize in fire. I'm not even worthy to unlatch his, his shoelaces. That's what he says. But I am not the one. He knew what they were getting at. He knew that this was the year that the Messiah should show up on the scene. But I know, I know who the one is. Now John is questioning. He's in prison. And many times when we find ourselves in difficult circumstances, we begin to question the purpose of God in our life. Come on, somebody say amen to that. Sometimes we go on through trials and tribulation, and we're like, wait a minute. Did I miss something? Or God, what are you doing to me here? John's in prison. I don't think he saw himself being in prison. And he wanted to know, did I do all this work? Is there somebody else coming? I'm not really sure. He began to second guess himself. Are you the one or do we look for another? Now, in John chapter 1, listen to what this says in John 1 and verse 15. John bore witness of him, Jesus, and cried out saying, This is the one who I spoke of. He that comes after me is preferred before me jump down to verse 26 and john answered him saying i baptize with water but the one that stands among you even now that you do not know the word know there ido e-i-d-o means to know perceive and understand with the heart ido there's one amongst you even right now and you don't even know him yet you you don't really you haven't begun to, to perceive yet that he's on the scene verse 27 he it is who's coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. Verse 29. The very next day, the very next day, John saw Jesus coming. The word see there is the word blepo, means to see with the eyes or to regard. He saw him coming, but he wasn't completely sure yet. See, sometimes you see something, but you're still not sure, Right? It's the same words used, don't go there, but in John chapter 20, when they come running to the tomb, they saw blepo, they saw the stone rolled away. And then John got there first, and then Peter goes, gets there, and Peter stepped inside the tomb. And the, the word saw, there's three different words used for the word saw. And Peter saw that the tomb was empty. And he saw the napkin or the linens folded up nice and neat. Jesus made his bed, right? But he saw folded up nice and neat. And it says that he saw that. And the word saw there is theorio. To see with the mind. To begin to ponder and understand something at a different level. Theorio. Where we get the word theory. So they saw with the eyes. They regarded that the, the grave or the, the stone is rolled away. And then John, it says he walked in, saw the same scene, saw it. And believed. The word saw there is Ido. It's amazing when you break those words down in John 20. They go from blepo to therio. Blepo to see with the eyes. To ponder it. To therio to, to begin to apply the mind. To begin to think it through. And be like, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say something about this? To Ido. To know with the heart. And it so said when John went in. When he stepped in. Sometimes we just got to take one more step and step in. And your revelation will increase. From Therio to Ido. And John stepped in, it says, and he believed because he understood, he got it. What Jesus said was going to happen absolutely happened. Same thing here when you're looking at this passage of scripture. And so John, uh, again, that was verse uh, 29. So the next day, John saw Blepo, he saw Jesus coming, wasn't still sure yet, and he said, Wait, behold the Lamb of God. Which takes away, that's the word ayero we talked about the other day, to lift up, to bear up, take up the sin of the world. He was, but he's telling you now he knows. Why? Because what he's going to tell you here following. This is he, who, which I said, after me comes a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, I did not ido him, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, I am coming baptized with water. And John, now this explains why he knows it's Jesus. And John bore record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. That's when I knew. Verse 33. And I knew him not. I did not idol him until that point. 
until the Spirit descended, I did not know with my heart with surety that this was the Messiah. Not yet. I wasn't quite sure. But when I saw the Spirit come down, and I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, God the Father, he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom you shall see, Ido, the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which will baptize with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and I bore record that this is the Son of God. Whoa, that is loaded. He goes from seeing Jesus coming to knowing that he's the one because God said, one day I'm going to send one to you who's greater than you, and you're going to baptize him with water, and you're going to know that he, without a shadow of a doubt, is the Messiah, the one that I have sent, my beloved son, because a dove will descend from heaven, you'll see it happen, and the Spirit will remain upon him. And I saw him. And it was this guy, Jesus. And so that's why he proclaimed, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He knew it because of what God had spoken to him already. But when we go back to John or to Matthew 11, now John is in prison saying, Are you the one? Again, I ask a question. Was John given the sign and did God prove it out who the Messiah was, yes or no? 100%. 100%. You believe that? Even John believed that. But now John is in prison, facing beheading. And he's wondering about his condition and saying, well, are you the one that sets the captives free or not? Sometimes our predicament, where we're at in life, what's going on all around us, will cause us to question God and even the path that we are on. You're human. I don't blame John I don't blame John. He's in prison. He wonders. And you know, Jesus doesn't tell his disciples, yes, 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 man. You should have realized that when I got baptized by you. He doesn't throw it in his face. He tells John's disciples, you go back and tell John what you just saw. The sick are being healed. The dead are being raised. Blind eyes are open. The deaf ears are open. He says, if that's not proof enough, I don't know what will be. Do you have proof in your life that Jesus is alive and well? Do you have proof in your life that this whole thing is not just a figment of our imagination, a made-up God? Do you have proof in your life? I do. Why would I ever question God? But John was human like you and I. And we get in those predicaments. We get in those tough times. We sometimes begin to question God. It's called being human. But you got to be brought back to your right mind. Amen? you got to be brought back to that. And I have to recall this to mind. I recall this to mind. Like Jeremiah when he's lamenting in Jeremiah. But this I recall back to my mind. It's of the Lord's mercies that we are not completely and utterly consumed. And his mercies are new how often? Every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. He had to remind himself. David had to remind himself, why are you so downcast, my soul? He's literally speaking within himself. Why are you so downcast? Put your hope in God. It may feel like God has let you down, but he never has. It may feel like God has left you, but he said, I never leave, I never forsake. You sometimes have to go back to faithing it because you don't feel it. And the Christian walk is all about faithing it, not feeling it. He will wean you off of needing to feel the presence or the move of God so that you will take it by faith. What if you don't feel God? Is he still here? Of course he is. You know, the word says where two or more are gathered in his name. The only name we're gathered in today, we're good here then, aren't we? We have more than enough, right? Where two or more are gathered. He's here. He's in our midst. In the, one of the commentaries of Matthew 11, the Bible says there that the kingdom suffers violence, but the violent do what? Take it by force. Or the kingdom of God, it says that this, like this in the commentary, make, is making great strides. Now is the time for courageous souls, forceful people to take hold of it. That sounds like action to me. That sounds like a call to arms to me. You know, but they said things like this about John. Oh, John, Jesus says, John came 
neither eating nor drinking, and you say, ah, oh, he's got a demon. The Son of Man comes, and you say, well, he's a wine bibber and a glutton, and he's a friend of sinners. He's got a demon too. Everybody got a demon to the Pharisees, right? You know, no matter what way God's anointed show up, it's never good enough for the religious people. Do you know that? It's never good enough for the religious. In John chapter 12, Jesus heals a man of a withered hand in the synagogue, right? He heals. Do you know how much work Jesus did on that Sabbath day? He just told the man, stretch forth your hand. Jesus just sitting there, just stretched forth your hand, and his hand got healed. And they want to kill the man for it. He didn't even literally break a sweat. He didn't even get up out of his seat, for all we know. He just said, stretch forth your hand. And they wanted to kill him because you didn't honor the Sabbath. Can you imagine being so stuffy about your religious traditions and law that you can't even look the Lord and the Sabbath in the eyes and appreciate that he just healed a man's withered hand? The audacity of mankind. The audacity. He healed a demon-possessed man, son of David. They caught, they cry, he cried out. In chapter 13, many prophets long to see what you guys see today. And Jesus was explaining these things through parables. And he said that the Son of Man will send angels. Also Matthew 13, at the very end it said that Jesus returned to Nazareth. But you know what they did there? They disrespected him because he was too familiar. <laughs> isn't, this, isn't that the Jesus, that Son of Mary? Right? Jesus. Who does he think he is? I promise you people will say that to you. God will jack you up and use you for amazing things. You ought to be expecting that, by the way. For God to jack you up and use you for amazing, miraculous things. That is our expectation. I expect that. I do. I fully expect God to do that through me as I surrender and obey him. Amen? But others will say, John Kurth, I knew him in high school. <laughs> Who did he think he is? Holy roller. That's what they'll do. That's what they'll say. Nate's back there agreeing, by the way. In chapter 14, John was beheaded in Matthew 14. And I want you to, again, I want you to feel the humanity of Jesus. Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully human. Now check this out. In Matthew 14, verse 13, it said that Jesus hears the news of what happened. And what does he do? He just wanted to be alone. He wanted to go to a place, go up on a mountain, and just be alone. They get in a boat, they go across the, uh, the lake, they, they get up, and he goes up to them, he just wants to be alone. He wants to go mourn and pray. His cousin is killed. The one, the one the Bible prophesied would make his ministry, like, pass straight, would actually lay it all out for him, like, would pave the road for his ministry to be there and ready to receive, is dead and beheaded. I think Jesus loved John deeply, I do. But his cousin John is beheaded, and I think he just wants to be left alone. When a loved one of yours dies, you don't, you don't want to be around a lot of people a lot of times. You just want to be left alone. You want to go mourn and pray and, and seek comfort in the Father's presence. But the people knew that he was coming, and they wouldn't leave him alone. And they, this, this all happens in one day. Catch this now. This is one day in the life of Jesus. He hears John's dead. He wants to go and pray and be left alone. And all the people throng him. They come after him, and they won't leave him alone. And rather than being able to have the time to properly weep and, and mourn a family member, a co-laborer in the faith, a dear brother in God, and instead of having that time, the people just kept coming after him. And he had great compassion, so he taught them, and he, and he prayed for them, and he laid hands on them. And then they're so hungry at the end of the day, they have no food. And this is when the, the miracle of him feeding 5,000 people, instead of nourishing him, his, his own soul and mourning and being left alone like he wanted to do, he still saw the people, and he saw that they needed his help. There was no time for that at that moment. And he feeds them. He literally feeds them 5,000 men and women and children besides that as well. So then he finally sends his disciples to the boat. He says, I still need to get alone yet. And he goes up and he goes in to pray at nighttime. He goes up and prays in the mountain. He finally gets his time to go and pray and seek the Father. Probably asking him, what's this all about? You know, Jesus, and when he was on earth, was not all-knowing. He had to surrender that right to be man. So he's probably asking the Father, 
John's dead? I mean, is this part of the plan? He was probably like, I I don't get it. I don't understand. He was taking these things to the Father. And it's that very night that the disciples are out there toiling, and Jesus walks on the water out to them. And Peter says, and they're all scared. They see a ghost. The disciples are still in fear. They've been with him. They just watched him feed well over 5,000 people. But would you say it's been a pretty rough day for Jesus? I would say yes. Can you feel compassion in your heart for the, for the, the moment he was having there and trying to get away? And then he has to go right back into ministry and, and teach and preach and lay hands on people and then feed them as well? He finally gets his alone time. The disciples are toiling out on the water. They think they're probably going to die. They see a ghost coming. It's not a ghost. It's Jesus. And Jesus says, it's me, guys. Fear not. All of this was in one day. One day in the life of Christ. When the, 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 or, uh, Peter says, if it's you, then beckon me to step out of the boat. Well, come on out, Pete. The water is fine. Peter steps out of the boat. Now, I know we know that Peter failed and he sunk when he got his eyes off of Jesus. And he saw the wind and the waves and all the stuff around him. And that's just a lesson in itself. Keep your eyes fixed upon Jesus. As long as he kept his gaze upon Jesus, his faith was there, and he was able to walk on water. And I always say, listen, I know he got back in the boat all wet, and he began to sink. But Peter was the only disciple that walked on water. Amen? At least he was willing to step out of the boat. And God wants us to step out. He knows full well that you are humanity. He knows full well that you've got brokenness and all sorts of issues in your life. He knows all that stuff. You're not hiding anything from God, amen? But his own disciples doubted. They lacked faith at times. Even in the midst of walking on water, Peter lacked faith. God wants us to understand something. Let me give you one more story about what God really spoke to me when I was reading the the story of the account of Jesus being arrested. And we know We know the story, kind of went through some of that just uh, yesterday, and they come to get him, right? But the disciples, they're arguing about who is the greatest amongst us. I I just, the the night that he's going to be betrayed, the day before he goes to the cross, and his disciples are arguing about who's the best, me or you. They're squabbling. I mean, does that sound familiar to anybody in the room? That we sometimes squabble over things that we should not be squabbling over. Amen? And they're squabbling with each other. Right? Turn to, real quick to Matthew 26 and Luke 22. We're going to flip back and forth real quick. Matthew 26, Luke 22. Are you all still with me? All right. Matthew 26. Verse 31. Then Jesus said unto them, you will all be offended. The word offended there is scandalizo, where we get the word scandalized. You will all be scandalized because of me this very night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep and the flock will be scattered. And after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. And Peter answered and said unto him, though all men shall be offended because of you, yet I will not be offended or scandalized. In the contemporary English version it says, even if all the others reject you, not this guy, I will not. And Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, before the uh, the cock crows, you shall deny me three times. And Peter said unto him, though I should die with you, I will not deny you likewise, underline this part, likewise also said all of the disciples. They all made the same claim. He said, every one of you going to skin out on me tonight. Every single one of you. Now turn quickly to John, or Luke, sorry, uh, 22. And we're going to start at uh, verse 31. And in verse 31, G- uh, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired or asked to have you. That he may sift you as wheat. He wants to sift you. And not just him. All of you, by the way. Because the word you there is actually plural. It's not singular. So he's saying it to Simon, but he really means it for everybody in the room. 
He's asked to sift you all as wheat. But I have prayed for you. Now, what you would expect Jesus to say is, but I told him no. I said, not today, devil. You're not going to sift Peter. That's not what Jesus said. That would have been comforting, right, had he said that, but he didn't. But I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And when you are converted, when you are converted, which means huh, you're going to be sifted like wheat. And you're going to fail. I pray that your faith will not fail, but you're going to fail to a point where you're going to need to be converted. Strengthen your brothers. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both into prison and into death. The night of the betrayal. Same thing he basically said earlier, right? Go down to verse 61. Well, verse 60. When, so, but wait, before we go there. So, they come to arrest Jesus. We know the story. They've got swords. The guard comes in, right? And Peter is going to make good. Come here, Caden, real quick. Stand up real quick. He's going to make good on his claim. And so Peter, when they come to arrest Jesus, he pulls out a sword, right? And this is a guy who's uh, one of the servants of the chief priest. His name is Malchus. One of the gospels actually names him. And Peter cuts off his right ear with a sword. Now, I don't know about you. I don't think Peter was probably bad with a sword. I don't think he had bad aim. But Peter, the Bible doesn't say that he was left-handed, so we assume he was probably a right-handed man. Because the Bible always goes through great length to tell you when somebody's left-handed. You know that, right? Okay. So... To draw your sword, you draw from your left hip. And I don't think he drew it and went like this because if he misses and hits the ear, he's going to hit him in the shoulder. And it doesn't say that anything happened there. Here's what I think it looked like. They come to arrest Jesus and Peter says, I told him, I'm told I'm willing to go to prison for being a murderer, by the way, because that was in his heart. He's going to kill this guy. I'm willing to go to prison for him to defend Jesus. I'm his bodyguard. I'm Peter. I'm, I'm the one who will protect Jesus. I want to go to prison or even die with him. And he pulls out his sword, and, as he, and he goes like this. This is the way I really believe that God showed me how this went. He pulls out his sword, and of course, what do you do when someone swings a sword at your head? You duck. And there it is. And that ear goes flying off to the ground. Thank you, Pete. Jesus picks the ear up off the ground. Peter, put your sword away. Comes over to Malchus, puts the ear back on, and heals him. Now, you would think everybody arresting Jesus would be like, whoa, whoa, maybe he is the son of God. You would think that, but not at all. And here's Peter demonstrating at the moment that he's most needed, I'm willing to kill somebody for you, Jesus. Just think about that phrase for a moment. I'm willing to kill somebody for you, Jesus. He was wet, ready to do whatever it took. All right, jump down to verse 60. We know that Jesus is arrested and Peter follows at a close distance. They all scatter, but Peter's following close enough and people keep asking him, hey, wait a minute. Aren't you that, that uh, Peter guy, right? Are you one of his disciples? No, 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 no. You got the wrong guy. No, because no, I am not. A little bit later, someone says, yeah, you look like one of his disciples. The guy that's over here, and again, Peter is close. He's staying at a distance, but he's close enough to be able to see what's going on. And I, no, 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 you got me mixed up with somebody else. It's the beard, isn't it? And then it says this, look at verse 60. And Peter said, man, I do not know what you're saying. And then the rooster began to crow. But back in uh, verse, uh, uh, Matthew uh, 26, verse 74, this is what it says there. And he began to curse and to swear, saying, I do not know the man. And immediately the cock began to crow. Not only did Peter deny Jesus three times, but because he talked like Jesus, he had to not talk like Jesus. He begins to curse and swear. I don't know the blankety blank is what he did. This is, your Bible says it. I'm not making this stuff up. He cursed and swore. In Luke 22, it says this. I want you to just put yourself in Peter's position just for a moment. You're at the crux of the moment when he needs you most. You already fell asleep on him in prayer tonight. You already pulled out a sword. You said, I'm going to make good on this, and I'm going to and, and kill a guy for you. Jesus says, put your sword away. You follow at a distance. You've denied him two times. You think already Peter's thinking, wait a minute, what am I doing? I'm Peter. 
I'm Petrus. I'm a rock. I'm his bodyguard. And the third time, he is so fearful that he begins to curse and swear and deny ever knowing him. And it says that the cock began to crow. Verse 61. And the Lord Jesus turned and looked upon Peter. I want you to feel this just for a moment. Here's Peter. I don't know the blankety blank. I don't know him. And it says Jesus' eyes turned and looked at Peter. And their eyes met in that moment. Can you imagine the shame? The humility. The conviction. The condemnation that Peter felt in that moment. Or switch sides. You're Jesus and you hear your trusted, beloved, inner circle disciple, swear and curse and say, I don't even know the man, and you look at him, and your eyes meet. How that made Jesus feel to be all alone, to be betrayed again, to be forsaken by those who swore allegiance just hours ago. He knew already this had to happen, it was going to happen, but imagine the pain Jesus' heart. And when he tells me that, I just begin to cry. Because I've been Peter. And you've probably been Peter too. And in the moment that he needed you, he said, I, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna say that. I'm not gonna be a holy roller. And Jesus' eyes met me in those moments. And I weep because I have let him down as Peter did. And of course, Peter quit the ministry of course he went back to fishing and yet he had to be converted back to strengthen his brother that's not the end of that story in that time and in that culture everybody had chickens like pastor jerry everybody had roosters the rooster crowing was like an alarm clock and and the rooster would crow every single day Every single time a rooster crowed, every single morning from that day forward, Peter was reminded of his failure. Every morning the rooster, cock a doodle doo. And Peter, Peter would wake up to the sound of, I denied him three times. He told me I would. He had to wake up every morning to that sound on his alarm clock. Oh, if he could just change that sound. But he couldn't. Unless he killed every rooster in Israel. Every morning he was reminded of his failure and the pain that he caused Jesus. Every morning he had that sadness, that look. He had to look back into those eyes of the one that he let down. Every morning he was faced with his failure as a disciple. And every morning he had to confess it and move on beyond it and understand I need to just receive his love anyways. What is your alarm clock? What is your cock-a-doodle-doo? What is it that God keeps reminding you of in your life? He doesn't do it because he's a sick and demented God. You have to always keep in mind the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. You see your spiritual poverty. Theirs is the kingdom. You want the kingdom? You never lose sight of your spiritual poverty. And God gave Peter a daily reminder. You're not such hot stuff without me, are you? Are you, Scooter? No, sir. You're not hot stuff without me. You need me and you need the Holy Spirit. You need power to die to yourself. So Peter had to return, as it says in Isaiah. In returning and in rest, you will be saved. In quietness and confidence, you shall have your strength. Returning and rest. I'm going to give you some R words here. Peter had to return back to the ministry, back to his love of his life, back to, and even though he had the pain of every morning hearing that rooster crow and seeing Jesus' eyes peer deep into his soul. The pain that he saw in those eyes, he never could erase that memory. That's what God told me. He never could erase that painful memory, but he used it as fuel in the fire, knowing full well. I can do nothing of myself, but with his power and his strength, I can do all things. There was a day that Peter walked to his own cross, amen? In returning, God wants you to return. He wants you to relent. That means quit striving. He wants you to repent of whatever it is 
Whatever thing it is that you are, repent of your dead works. He wants to refresh you and he wants to rest you. Even after you fall, the answer is yes. That I would return, relent, repent, refresh, and rest. This is what God has for all of us. Amen? We have to understand that God has given us. The Bible says that the kingdom of God is righteousness. Help me out. Peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Not apart from. In the Holy Ghost. What does that replace? Guilt, shame, and condemnation. The unholy trifecta that the devil tries to wear every saint out with. He will get you with guilt. Yes, I'm guilty. Shame and condemnation. He replaces your guilt with righteousness. Yes, you are guilty, but I've made you righteous by the power of my blood. We sang it today. He replaces your shame with peace. Shame nips at your heels all the time. You're ashamed of yourself, but he gives you peace to overcome the shame. And he gives you joy in the place of condemnation. You don't have to be a condemned criminal anymore because someone paid the price that you could not pay. Let me end it with this. I know I've gone long. Author and theologian Michael Heiser said this of Genesis chapter 1. He says that we were made in the image of God, like it says in Genesis 1. But the word in there doesn't always mean the same thing. For instance, I can put the dishes in the sink, right? Represents, I'm putting it, it denotes a location. Or I broke the mirror in pieces, denotes the result of an action. I broke the mirror in pieces. And some would say things like, I work in education, which simply means I work as a teacher or as an educator. The word in there means as. This is the way he meant the word in Genesis chapter 1. Man was created in the image of God or as the image of God. We were made in his likeness, so you were made as the image of God. We were created to image God to be his imagers, to look like God, to act like God, to talk like God, to, to minister on behalf of God. That is your right as sons and daughters of the king. Your, your royalty, after all. So we are God's ambassadors. We are his representatives on the earth. God intends us to be him, to be his hands to be his feet, to be his mouth on this earth. Could he do it without us? Absolutely. He chose not to. He wanted this story to include you and I. I think it's awesome. I think it's awesome. Let me give you two more things to just to, to think about as we leave here today. In John chapter 1, verse 4, uh, 1 John 1, sorry, 1 John 1, chapter 4, we know he talks about love quite a bit there. But verse 17 says this. It ends like this. Nine words. As he is, so are we in this world. First John 4, 17. As he is, so are we in this world. What more proof do you need to know that we are made as imagers of God? And lastly, in Romans chapter 8, it says that all creation groans and travails, Right? Waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. I don't know about you, but I look around, I watch the news, I look around the world, and I see all of creation, all the world is like groaning, like something is, ha it's like messed up. But when it says travail there, the word travail is very similar to the word that we see in Matthew 24 when he says that these are the beginning of sorrows or birth pangs. We, uh, the, you know, the, the first, second, third, and fourth seals, right? These are the beginning of sorrow. Something's about to be birthed. We know a man-child's about to be birthed. It's the same word, except it's not exactly the same word. The word odino means birth pangs or sorrows. And this word in Matthew 8, verses 22 and, or sorry, Romans 8, 22 and 23, is the word sin odino, which means this, with or together labor pains, or labor pains in union together is what it means. It only appears one time in your Bible that all the earth is growing, all creation is growing, something is happening. The earth is ready to birth something. 
Now, the devil has an idea what he wants to birth, but God has his idea too. And I know whose plan is going to prevail in the end, amen? So together we are travailing, we're in unity travailing for something to be born. And they're waiting for the manifestation of you and I to actually show up on the scene. Just like Jesus did once before. This world needs us. Literally, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. This world needs us as saviors and redeemers to rise up and take our place and be the sons and daughters of God that we've been called to be. Let's all stand. Together pangs. Together sorrows. We are going to walk this out together. We need one another. Every one of us are individuals, but together we are the body of Christ. Parts in particular, but we are together in unity. The body of Christ. Jesus, the Son of God, became the Son of Man to teach the sons of men how to be the sons of God. You are the sons of God. It is our inheritance. We are joint heirs with Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. You guys can go ahead and play if you want to play. Heavenly Father, we're humbled that you would choose us. We didn't choose you. Let's be real. You chose us. We're making our calling, our election, sure, but Lord, I, for the foundations of the earth, you wrote the Lamb's Book of Life. Father, we don't want to just be good Christians. That's not enough. We don't just want to go to church and give our tithes and be good, moral people. Never was that enough for you. Many can by their own willpower be a good and moral person if that's the case, but you want us, Lord God, to be Jesus in this world. You said that we are lights set on a hill. You said that we are the light of the world. You were, but when you checked out, you said, I'm going to give it to you to do. I've given you the keys to the kingdom. And I want to remind you this day, I have given you everything necessary for you to triumph in righteousness in your own lives, in the body of Christ, and in this world. God is reminding us this day that he has chosen us to be a peculiar people, a royal priesthood for such a time as this. I didn't choose others. Even my beloved Peter, I didn't choose to live in this hour, but 2,000 years ago. I chose you, church, for this day, for this appointed time, for this season, to fulfill all things kingdom in this hour. And I will finish the work that I have begun in your heart. So all I ask this day, says the Lord, is that you would just lay down your life. That you would submit yourself to me. And you would simply obey. Come on, is it that hard? It's because our own will gets involved. Our own ideas get involved. That's what conflicts with us. It certainly did for Peter and all the other disciples. You're in good company, church. Come on, brothers and sisters. You're in good company. But God got the job done in guys like Peter. In persecutors of Christ like Saul, who became Paul the Apostle. God can do whatever he wants. And he does. So understand this. Because I have called you, I have gifted you. Many of you today are unaware or unclear of what I have put within you. And it's time, starting today, that you find that out. I have already put deposits of my gifts inside of you. And it's high time that you know what you are to be and what you are to do. For I have crafted you, I have formed you from your mother's womb for a purpose. For such a time as this. In this day, in this hour, you will be light set upon the hill. No longer shall you cover up your light, says the Lord. But let it shine and let it shine brightly. No more shall you be embarrassed to say the name of Jesus 
everywhere that you go, proclaim the name of your Lord and Savior. Father, I want to just leave a deposit here today. Two things. Number one, I want to bless this church, Lord God. Lord, these have been my dear brothers and sisters for many, many years now. And when I come here, I feel as though I'm coming home to family every single time. So, Lord God, the love that they have shown me, Lord God, I thank you for my family here. And I pray, Lord God, that greater works shall they do. Lord, that there will be great exploits. My phone's about to blow up with text messages and phone calls about the great exploits happening in Elizabethtown, Kentucky. Right here at Bethesda. Because you called this house, Lord God, to stand out in the community, to stand out in the state, and to stand out in this nation. You said you were looking for those to stand in the gap. You found them here, Lord. You found them here. This house is such a one. And I declare it, Lord God, that this house will be a house that will grow, Lord God, because not just in numbers, but in the depth of discipleship, Lord God, will go so deep that people, man, will marvel at the spiritual revelation that comes out of this out of this house. And not just from a few. I see dozens of people, dozens of people having the word of the Lord and great revelation. And lastly, I just feel like the Lord wanted me to open up. If there's anybody here, as I spoke these words, and it touched your heart, and you, you feel like you are not where you need to be with God. Pastor Jerry said, I was a, an 18-year-old thug. <laughs> but I'm so glad that Jesus reminded me of his goodness. If you need to commit your life to Christ, maybe for the first time ever, or maybe you need to recommit your life to Christ, I'm just going to ask these guys to play a little music for a little while, and if you want to come up here and pray and kneel at this altar and do business with Christ, you do that now. Amen? So, Father, we just... Even now as I pray, if there's anybody here that needs to commit their life to you or to recommit their life to you, Lord God, that you would talk in their heart right now, that they come running up here to this altar right now to surrender it all to Jesus. Because I don't want to leave here today knowing, Lord God, that I didn't give some kind of an altar call for salvation. I want to leave here knowing, Lord God, that the offer was made. Whether you accept it or not is up to you, but the offer was at least made. Don't look back on this day in history and say, yeah, I wish I'd have made the choice on that day that preacher said those words. Don't look back on this day with that kind of disdain. Know ye now that this is the call of God beckoning some people here. If that is you, just come up here right now. We want to pray with you that you surrender everything to Jesus. And I will tell you this, I do not regret for one moment the choices that I made to serve God with all my heart and surrender up my will my path, my destiny, I had it all laid out too. And none of it went the way that I thought it would go. And I'm glad for it every single day. I wouldn't be here today had God not messed with me at the right moment. So let's just sing this song, let's sing for a moment, and then if that is you and you want to come up here, we want to pray with you.
Aren't you thankful? Let's give the Lord a hand.